Hey, we North Mr. Eagle here. Let's talk about kinetics. Uh, this is going to be the first video in our kinetics unit. Uh, we're going to look at the factors affecting reaction rates. Uh, we're going to start by explaining uh, what's called the collision theory. This is kind of our model for understanding how reactions work, uh, and then describe the rate of rate of reaction, what affects the rate of reaction, um, and kind of go through all the different things that affect that rate. Collision theory is how we kind of understand how reactions work. Um, in order for a reaction to occur, particles must physically collide with each other, and they have to collide successfully. So not every collision between two particles is going to result in a reaction. In fact, most of them uh, don't result in reactions. Otherwise, we'd have just reactions going on constantly all the way all around us. We're just going to assume that there's only two particles colliding at a time, just to kind of keep things simple. And the, the criterion for a successful collisions has to be that they have enough energy they have to kind of overcome the, that initial electron repulsion because um, each atom, think of each atom, has its, has its valence shell. In order for them to, to uh, form a bond and release energy, their electrons have to overlap. Uh, so they have to get past that initial repulsion of the valence shell. And then they also have to have the correct proper orientation. This is where that picture up here um, helps to kind of understand this. If just through random motion they happen to collide like this, let's say that that's not a successful collision. But if they're oriented the right way, if one of the molecules is kind of spun 90 degrees, um, and again, this is just random motion. We're not really directing which, you know, how they're hitting each other. Now we can have a successful collision. And this is just kind of a rough example. So some collisions will be unsuccessful because they collide in the wrong orientation, and other collisions can be unsuccessful because they collide with not enough energy. You could collide with the correct orientation but not enough energy, and it still wouldn't re make a good reaction. When the reaction is taking place, there's a, for a split second, there's what's called the uh, activated complex, okay? We have this like intermediate uh, molecule that exists for, for just a very brief amount of time where it can technically still go back to reactants uh, or it can go to products, right? This is kind of at the peak of our, of our energy diagram, at, at the peak of our activation energy. Another thing to keep in mind is that the more collisions we have, in general, the more successful collisions we're going to have, right? So concentration plays a big role. At low concentration, you're going to have very few collisions, and so then even fewer uh, successful collisions. But at high concentration, you can have more collisions in general, and more in general collisions, you're going to get more uh, successful collisions as well. You guys know I can't talk about this without really talking about the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. If we have a, a sample our reactants at two different temperatures, more if let's say that this speed let's say they have to be going at least this fast in order to react right at a higher temperature the the curve is shifted to the right and it's lower because it's more there's more distribution and a larger percentage of the of the molecules are going that fast right shade um, as represented by the darker shading which is kind of overlapping the slider shading right so all these molecules have enough energy to perform a successful reaction meanwhile at a lower temperature you have a smaller portion of them able to react. So this is kind of ignoring the orientation factor of the successful collision. It doesn't matter if they're oriented right if they don't have enough energy, right? The molecules that are going this speed aren't going to react regardless of their orientation. But at a higher temperature, you're, you have a higher portion of molecules traveling at a high enough speed in order to possibly make a successful reaction. We use the term reaction rates to refer to the speed at which reactants are turned into products. This is normally tracked by monitoring the change in concentration over time. And that could be the change in concentration of a reactant or the change in concentration of a product, right? Because as the reaction progresses, uh, we're changing our, our concentrations of our reactants and products. And because those concentrations are changing, uh, the re reaction rate itself is, is usually not consistent. This picture demonstrates this pretty well. If we have our initial conditions where we have 100% uh, A, after a certain amount of time, now we have some A and some B. As time progresses, we have less and less A, and so our concentration of our A is decreasing, resulting in fewer collisions of, between particles of A to make B, and so the reaction rate is actually going to slow down. So the fastest, the, the point of the reaction at which it's the fastest is going to be that initial second, right? The first second is, has a higher rate than the second second, which has a higher rate than the third second, because those concentrations are changing. Uh, every second. So let's use this generic formula to kind of represent this. We can think of the rate as the change in concentration of A, of a reactant, over the change in time. Okay, uh, This bracket, these square brackets, are a way to represent molarity. We could also say that the rate 
is equal to the change in, in the concentration of the products over time, right? Would kind of basically be the same thing in this case because it's just kind of a one-to-one -one ratio. Notice that the rate of the reactant is negative and the rate of the product is positive. Our, our reactants are decreasing in concentration over time, right? We start with all reactants and as time progresses, as the reaction progresses, we have less and less reactant. And so our our concentration of our reactants is going to drop over time, so that's why that's always going to be negative. This is a, a great graph to kind of show this. We're graphing concentration over time. Remember that, again, the brackets represent concentration, usually molarity. And our concentration of our B is increasing, and our concentration of our A is, is, is decreasing. Notice that it's not linear. Um, that first 10 seconds has a higher rate than the last 10 seconds. All right, several other factors that affect the reaction rate. Uh, we've talked about concentration. The more molecules you have, the more collisions you have. Um, also, the nature of the reactants, uh, that would refer to like phases and IMFs. This is kind of similar to, to describing it in terms of surface area. Think about reacting a solid sodium chloride versus aqueous sodium chloride. Aqueous, you're exposing every single ion. You're basically increasing the surface area. In solid, you have a lot more structure. It's a lot more difficult to break away these ions to get them to react with something because they're kind of locked in this lattice structure. If they're freely fo floating around in a solution, though, they have both a higher surface area because every particle is exposed, not just the surface ones, and they are not kind of locked into a, into a solid structure. The temperature of the reaction makes a big difference because we have faster moving particles, higher collision, uh, higher collision speeds, higher portion of the molecules having enough speed to, to have a successful collision. In general, 10 degree change increase in temperature doubles the reaction rate. Adding an inert, inert gas has no effect. So if there's just an extra gas in there, like let's say we have some gas uh, reaction, and there's some other gas present that uh, is just kind of there and not not involved in the reaction, it will actually have no, no effect because the concentration of the gas that is reacting, you could think of it in terms of partial pressure, the partial pressure of the gas that, that is reacting is unaffected by the partial pressure of the inner gas. Finally, a catalyst. Catalyst makes uh, the reaction rate go a lot faster. The catalyst is a substance that changes the rate of the reaction without undergoing a permanent chemical change itself. That means it's not involved in the reaction. It's not a reactant. It's not a product. It just facilitates the reaction and that's it. Typically, it's just lowering the activation energy. Uh, we can just think of it as facilitating a successful, a successful collision. So this picture does a good job of, of showing this. It may be the case that it's, it takes less energy for this reactant to join onto the catalyst and less energy for this reactant to join onto the catalyst and then for them to join to each other than for just them to join to each other by themselves. So sometimes you may see some graphs that have a couple humps in here uh, that are all lower than the original hump because there's like a new pathway that's being developed. There's a new process because we have one reactant grabbing the, the enzyme, the enzyme grabbing the other reactant, and then putting them together. That's actually three kind of steps to the reaction, which all of which would have a lower activation energy than the uncatalyzed reaction. A couple things to note, highlight these uh, in your notes. We're lowering the activation energy. Notice that the energy of the reaction has not changed. The catalyzed reaction and the original reaction both have the same total energy change, right? This is an exothermic reaction. We're decreasing in energy, and we're decreasing in energy the same amount regardless of whether or not it's catalyzed. The reaction rate is going to go faster because you have a higher number of particles that have this particular energy in order to have a successful reaction. So it's kind of like increasing the temperature in the sense that it, it increases the number of particles that have enough energy to, to successfully react. So that's just the factors affecting reaction rates and kinetics. Now we're going to get into rate laws and calculating uh, reaction rates in the next video. All right, this is Mr. Yergler signing out.